Sunday. Sunday, Sunday. Okay, well, good morning. Happy Super Bowl Sunday. Are you excited? Yeah. All right, a lot of great things going on. I hope you're fired up to worship God today. Now, there are a few announcements that Dustin forgot. There is grace, okay. Uh, we are not going to have a meal afterwards uh, because I heard there's a few meals going on uh, around the kingdom. Uh, and so we're going to have those Super Bowl parties. That'll be awesome. And there will not be a leaders meeting today. Uh, just for those who have been talked to already, we'll have a short meeting at 1.30. But for the rest of you, go and have fun. Amen. Amen. I hope you're focused today. You may be wondering why I'm not wearing a jersey. Now, for those of you who don't know me, I'm from Green Bay, Wisconsin. Oh, oh. And, and I wanted to do this sermon without being a distraction to the Chicagoites here. Uh, amen. Uh, I noticed Nana kept his coat on uh, for the whole, uh, before he, he got here. I didn't know if he was embarrassed of the Eagles or what, but... Didn't want to be a distraction, huh? Yeah. Uh, I do have bad news for today. Uh, there's a national tragedy. Uh, there was a shortage of uh, wicked, uh, chicken wings. <laughs> wicked chicken wings. There's a shortage. Yeah, I know, I know. It, and it, it, it is going to affect a lot of Super Bowl parties. I know, I know. I guess the drought this summer affected the chickens. And uh, now we have a lot less chicken wings. If you've noticed, they've gone up in price. But they still said that if you took all the chicken wings we already have and put them end to end, all right, that you could go from San Francisco to Baltimore 27 times. And that's what's going to get devoured today. Them poor chickens. So anyways, I was thinking, what, what should I talk about today? You know, there's a lot of great theme, uh, themes you could have, like uh, discipline, you know, to get to the Super Bowl, and, and imitation, and following leadership, and team effort, and passion, and all these things. And you know, this week, they've had so many great th focuses when it comes to Super Bowl. Super Bowl week, there's always something. People are trying to find something to bring up in, in the news, okay? There's a few great quotes. There's one here. It says, it's not about winning the game. It's about what it took to get there. Sounds pretty good, right? But then you had the negative ones, all right? Now, you guys know who Ray Lewis is? Played for the Ravens, I think, 17 years, all pro, okay? And, and they said, some guy said he had taken uh, drug-enhancing stuff when he was younger from deer antlers, Who'd have thunk, right? Then you got Mike, Big Mike, or remember the movie Blindside? He's going to be playing uh, today. And uh, if you don't remember the movie, he was taken in. Uh, he, didn't, he was kind of homeless, and a white couple took him in, and he's this huge, big guy. And there's a whole story on it. You get all teared up when you see it. And uh, he had a, a friend that he knew from the San Francisco team. Exact same thing, taken in by a white couple, this and that, and now they're all, they're buddies and all that. And he's like, hey, listen, I'm sick of hearing that stuff. Can you quit bringing it up? It's like, uh, ever since the movie came out, that's all you guys talk about. And so you, you get all these different slants on the Super Bowl. Page two. <laughs> now you may be thinking, I've done nothing great. There's nothing super about my life. I don't have a degree. I've never been anywhere. I have no abilities. I have no victory story. Ooh. But you know, when you go to the Super Bowl, there's only 50-some players that win. And as a disciple, we all win the Super Bowl. We all go to heaven. And it's a lot more glorious than that. We can all do it. And to become a disciple is a victory story. Do you feel that way. 
Now, if you go to a lot of these statistics about what these guys do to get to the Super Bowl and all, and all the pain and suffering, it's amazing. There's a statistic out there that says that on an average, a professional football team player will die 20 years sh shorter than anybody else. And then they have all these things wrong with them. Knee and hip injuries, right? The concussions. But if you, you ask them, would they do it again? They'd say, absolutely. Why? For the glory. People want to be a part of something great. They want to be a part of something awesome. And for many, it's, it's all that is. But then when you're there and you win, what is life after that? It's all looking back to the glory days. The glory days. As a disciple, the glory days are today. And forever on into eternity. And a lot of times we just don't see the glory days in every way. But it's all about perspective. So we're going to talk about our motivation. The title today is A Super Motivation. Yeah, I, I just came up with that. It's pretty awesome. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to look at what God talks about and what he does to motivate us. Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 31. Come on, Jay. Come on, Jay. Come on, bro. Preach it, bro. Here's my beginning question. What motivates you? What inspires you to be an overcomer? What inspired you to get to church today? What got you here? What motivates you to be who you are? Verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and that's, that's what we're talking about. Being with God is greater than the Super Bowl. Amen? And all the angels with him. And won't that be an amazing day? He will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate the people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, Whatever you did for the one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Pretty intense, right? Let's read on. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Whoa. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me. And I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He replied, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Wow! Intense little passage for Super Bowl Sunday. A lot of us don't like to think about hell. Well, it's a reality. If you believe the Bible, it's there. And nobody talked more about hell than Jesus. 
But there is a reason why he did it. It's called motivation. All right? A lot of people don't want to believe in hell. I can't believe that God would do that. Well, God doesn't do that. We do it. Right? But you look at this passage and you think about what was the dividing line? What was the acid test of where, whether a person made it to heaven or whether they made it to hell? And it comes down to character. Loving people. Loving your neighbor. Loving God. And, and the, the people who did it said, when did we do it? He said, whenever you did it for my children, you did it for me. Now, the challenging question is, is that what we do? Would you pass the test? Now, are you fear motivated to do it? You read this, man, there you got it, fear. And if you read through Matthew, Jesus talks about hell all the time. Read through Matthew 24, 25. It's all over the place. And you got to look at it and you got to say, you know, it's a, a reality. Do I fear God? Do I respect him? Do I fear going to hell? And this is point number one, fear. Does, fear motiva uh, does hell motivate you? Are you fear motivated? A lot of people are. I used to be. And I know a lot of people who are. And they're, they're controlled by fear. Proverbs 9, verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, is that what God wants in a relationship with us? For us to just walk around fearful of him all the time? No. No, but it's where some of us need to begin. Some of us need to be jolted into reality. That, dude, you need to wake up. You're playing with fire here, and it's about time you get in, into the battle here. Come on, bro. Jesus preached on it all the time. Come on, Jay. Yep. But the righteous said, Lord, when did we do these things? It wasn't like they were fear motivated because they didn't even remember doing it. Yeah. It wasn't like, oh, I better do this or I'll go to hell. Yeah. That's not what you sense in this passage. They did it because it was who they are. Yeah. Now we got to look at our motivation and say, okay, how do I get to that point? Where it becomes who I am versus just doing it because I have to or I, I'm afraid or whatever. What is it that's going to get us over the hump? There's a lot of programs out of there to fear motiv motivate people. If you ever know uh, a, a child who, or a teenager, a troubled teenager, and they, they take them to a prison and walk them around for a while, yeah. this is where you're headed, kid. Yep. And, and it wakes them up like, whoa, fear motivation. How about driver's ed? Did you ever have those driver ed movies? You know, you're watching this. This is what happens when you drink and drive. And these kids are getting beheaded and blood. And you're like, afraid to get in the car. I don't want to drive anymore, Mom. But they use it to wake us up. And so does God. But you know, if you're fear motivated, it's, it's just not going to last. After a while, you'll give up. You'll quit. Point number two, are you guilt motivated? Now, once again, do you think these guys were guilt motivated? That they did it because they, that, man, I, I just feel guilty. I need to serve someone today. I don't think so. Once again, it's not like they remembered it. Well, I better do it or I'll feel like trash, so that's what I'm going to do. That's not very inspirational. I don't think people went to the Super Bowl with that kind of spirit. Oh, I just feel real guilty, so I'll just work hard because, you know, otherwise I'm trash. Look in John 16. Let's talk a little bit about this guilt thing. And I know I did a, a, a sermon, a whole sermon on it, but it's always good to go back and remind us about it. In John 16... Verse 5. It says, Now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you ask me, Where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. 
when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. And you gotta, you gotta think about this. Well, why would God want to convict the world of guilt? Well, the reason being is most people don't feel guilty or realize they are guilty. Why? Because the world's standards have confused and blinded most people. People don't feel like they're guilty and in sin because everybody else does it. There's a lot of people I'll study the Bible with, and, uh, you know, they, they may be living in an immoral relationship, and they think it's okay. They look at the Bible, it's, no, it's not okay. Well, why would they think it's okay? Because everybody else is doing it. Uh, a number of years, I had gone to the uh, Soviet Union uh, for school. And uh, I studied the Bible with a lot of uh, people from Russia who came out of a communist background. And in that background, there was no religion. It was against the law. All forms were kicked out. Muslim, Buddhist, everything. So when we'd study the Bible with them, they had no sense of morality. A whole nation. And to them, it's, this makes sense, therefore it's good. And I remember a woman saying, you know, uh, what I appreciated about America is that everybody lives together it makes sense because then you know if you can get along and then you can get married. And that's how they thought. There was no sense of wrong and right on a moral level. It's just what made sense. And so God gives us the Holy Spirit to convict us of guilt. Now guilt isn't whether you feel like it or not. We talked about that before. Guilt is a state of being. Either you're guilty or you're not. The judge doesn't care how you feel. He says guilty or not guilty. And see, that's where we can get messed up. The question is, are you motivated by guilt? What motivates you? Look in Acts chapter 24. Let's look at an example of this and see what happens here. Acts chapter 24. You got Paul here. He's on trial. Now, Paul takes advantage of being on trial. He's thinking, hey, I'm in front of the judge here. I might as well preach the gospel. Imagine that. You go to trial for someone who knows. Judge, let me share some things with you. You don't care if you're, you know, get a ticket or not. I'm going to preach to the judge. That's Paul. Amen. Chapter 24, verse 24. It says, several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ, Jesus. And as Paul discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid <laughs> and said, uh, that's enough for now. <laughs> you may leave. When I find it convenient, it, I will send for you. At that, the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. Okay, so what was his motive? Money. But Paul seizes the opportunity to preach to him. And you know it hit, hit him, because what did he talk about? Being righteous before God, right? Self-control, and the judgment to come. That would have been an incredible sermon to hear. Right there. It would have been awesome to watch Paul challenge this guy. Now, you got to understand, there's a little dynamic going on here. Drusilla was a Jewess. She understood what was going on. And she was uh, a well-known historical figure. Now, what she had done is she had left her husband to marry this guy, Felix. All right? Had nothing to do with adultery. She wanted to be with this guy because he was a high-powered guy. All right, now here's her background. She is one of three daughters of Herod Agrippa I. Who is he? He's the one who killed the Apostle James in Acts 12. She, was all, she had a great uncle. His name was Herod Antipas, who beheaded John the Baptist. And her great-grandpa, Herod the Great, killed all the babies in Bethlehem trying to kill Jesus right before his birth. So she had a little bit of influence in her life. 
And her whole upbringing was messed up. Can you imagine this talk? Let's have a little talk in Jesus. Now, what does he do here? He's trying to convict them of guilt. And he's using fear motivation. You see that? And see, some people, that's where you need to begin. People without a heart for God sometimes need to be jolted back to reality. And for a lot of us, that's where we began. And for a lot of people out there, that's where we need to go. But once again, the guilt and the fear aren't going to take you for the long haul. It could be a progression thing for us to get to the, the heart of the people we see in the book of Matthew. Well, look in 1 Timothy. We're going to talk about a third motivation. It's called grace. Oh, shoo, good, Jay. You're getting a little heavy here on us. Give me a little grace. But you got to realize where Peter and Paul came from, okay? Imagine Peter betrayed Jesus, heard the rooster crow, and for every morning he could have felt guilty for the rest of his life. Every time he heard a rooster crow, remind him of what he did to Jesus. Same thing with Paul. What was he doing before he became a Christian? He was killing Christians. And every time he preached, I'm sure he could see people, oh, I killed your mother, I killed your brother, your daughter. So what motivated him? Guilt? I don't think so. He understood it. Look what he says here, verse 12. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Uh, notice he says full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom... I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus, might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to him, to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He starts off by saying, I want to thank God. People who are grace-motivated are grateful. They're thankful. And he says, I was a mess. I was a blasphemer. I was a horrible person. But God showed me, all right, this thing called grace. And he used me as an example to show you his unlimited patience. And grace is one of those things where... It's hard to accept a lot of times because we feel so guilty. Yeah. Uh, Barb and I were getting together with a gal who uh, was trying to get restored here. And all she did was cry about all her sin in the past. All right? Now, she, she had been a disciple years ago, but fell away. And I believe a lot of it was because the burden was so heavy. She couldn't get over this guilt. And she just kept crying. And I went to Romans 8 where it says in verse 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I said, Satan is trying to continually make you think you're guilty when you're not. You're baptized, you're cleansed, you're free. And if you don't accept this, you're saying the cross was not enough. She went like this. The cross was enough. I said, then act like it. Do you see, uh, see the point here? Yeah. But Satan gets us caught up in this guilt thing all our lives, and we can't move forward. He's got us stopped. And if, if we are guilty, we need to accept it and repent. But if we're not, we need to accept the grace. On, Have you been shown mercy? I would say many times. Yeah. Yeah. Were you a blasphemer? I would say many times. I certainly was. 
I have a little story to tell. When I was in eighth grade, back when the earth was cooling, when I was in eighth grade, I uh, had a shop class in electricity, all right? And uh, I also was a Boy Scout. Boy Scout. And um, I had gotten an electricity merit badge the year before, all right? And the teacher was the one who helped me get the merit badge, and he signed off on it, and so on and so forth, right? So I had gotten this, and, and what we were doing in the class was we were making extension cords. Pretty cool, huh? Well, one, the one thing about an extension cord, if, if you don't, you know, put it together right, you can ground something out, okay? Now, we all finished our extension cord, but before we did, the teacher said, listen to me. I didn't want anybody trying their extension cord in class here, okay? I don't want you touching the outlets with your extension cord. Here's why. Because you will wipe out all the electricity in the school. It'll be exceedingly costly. People will be working on projects, and right then and there, the electricity will end for them. Don't do it, or else. Well, oh, he laid it on pretty thick, right? So guess what? Put that baby in there. And all the lights went off. And it wouldn't come out. And everybody looked back. Were you talking to me? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you were saying. I was caught red-handed. There it was, in my hand. And I had the fear of God in me. I thought, I'm gonna die. This guy knows about electricity. Now, I'm in eighth grade, I'm thinking electric chair. Electricity, you know, that kind of thing. And he goes, Shelbrick, after class, you're staying. Okay. So I thought, I I'm dead. Life is over. You know, I'm thinking this is going to cost my parents hundreds of dollars, the damage I did. I didn't know anything, right? So, and uh, he sits down with me. He said, I can't believe I signed that merit badge thing for you. <laughs> what were you thinking? So I had visions of standing in front of the merit... <laughs> And the Boy Scouts and them ripping off my merit badge. <laughs> that kind of thing, you know? <sighs> Can't believe you do this. When it really laid into me, and then he said, Get out of here. And that was it. No phone call to mom or dad. And I felt grace. I'm going to live longer. But I went from fear to guilt to grace. It was like, bam, just like that. And isn't it awesome when someone gives you grace? Yeah. Now, you know you deserved it. Good slap upside the head or something. But some people can't let it go. They can't be happy unless they get that slap upside the head. And God doesn't want us to live that way. Look in Titus chapter 2. You see, Jesus took the hits we deserve. So the question is, is the cross enough? You guys relate with this? Yeah. Never made it to Eagle. Okay. Titus chapter 2, starting in verse 11. It says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, 
who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. This is an amazing passage here. Uh, just a side note, uh, if you ever, anybody ever asks you, where is it in the Bible? Does it say Jesus God? It's right here. The glorious appearing of a great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay. Just a freebie right there. Amen. Amen. But he says the grace has appeared to all men. And for a lot of us, it goes right over our head. We don't even realize when we're getting grace. And we, it, it'll bounce right off of us. It says to all men, no matter how bad we've had it or what we've done, he says, listen, I'm offering you a free ticket. That's amazing. Paul said, listen, I'm the example. But he also says something here. It says it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly life in this present age. Now, here's the challenging question. Does that define you? Does that define me? Do I say no to the worldly passions? Do I say no to the ungodliness in my life? And if I don't, then the grace is not motivating us. There's something wrong. There's a, a breakdown in the connection and the understanding of what has happened. If you're living a life where you're giving in to sin consistently, you're saying the cross isn't enough or I don't care. I'm going to abuse you, God, and I don't care. That's what's going on. Hebrews 10.26 says, hey, if you deliberately keep on sinning, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Oh, babe, that's <laughs> intense. But what it's saying is, listen, you're abusing the grace. These people had known Jesus, had known about the cross, were baptized, forgiven, and they deliberately keep on sinning. And he says, you become my enemy. Whoa. Versus, what do I got to do, God? I am with you heart and soul. Thank you so very much. He ends by saying they've been redeemed. They've been brought back into a relationship with God. And finally he says they're eager to do what's right. Does that define us? Is that what motivates us to do what's right? Are we eager? I want to do it, God. Why? Because I'm so grateful for what you've rescued me from. So grateful that you put these people in my life. So grateful for the cross. Does it motivate us? Or are we still in the fear stage? The guilt stage? And we've got to move to the grace stage. Here's the question. Why did you come to church today? What was your motive? Fear motivated? Someone's going to challenge you about it? God's going to cause you to have a bad week. Because you didn't go to church. God's hand is against you. Now, there are people who think like this. Seriously. Or did you come because you're guilt motivated? I'll be a bad person. Or maybe worse, what can I get out of the church today? I like to come because people are nice. They give me hugs, and they'll buy me a meal. And all I have to do is show up. Or maybe it's, I just want to feel better about myself. Why did you come today? I want you to think about that. Sense of duty? Sense of worth? I'm expected to? I'm a leader, so I should come? come, on. come on. If you brought a visitor today, why? Because you love them? Or, well, I, I, you know, it's what we do. I'm going to be challenged on it. Or I get my self-esteem. Oh, bro, you brought another visitor. Oh, you're awesome. Why did you do it? And it comes down to a heart issue. And the acid test, Jesus said, these people fed me, clothed me, visited me in prison. When's the last time you went to prison to visit someone? 
You see what I'm saying? This is it's not a, a joke here. This is serious stuff. Quiet time. Why did you have your quiet time? Why do you do it? Check. I got to do it. It's a righteous thing to do. Well, it makes me feel better. Uh, it gives me more knowledge so I can fight that battle with that religious person. Why did you do it? Because you want to be with God. I can't. I can't help but be with God. He's awesome. He's amazing. When's the last time someone came to you and said, I remember a few years ago when you did this and that, and you don't remember. When did I do that? That's what he's talking about. That's the heart that we're looking for. All right, let's take it higher. Do you guys like to take it higher? No. There's a lot of reasons we could be motivated, but a lot of them can be pure motivation. We just have a heart for people. We love people. We have a passion for helping them because we see their pain and suffering. That's the heart of Jesus, right? Yeah. But I want to talk about something else. I want to talk about being in awe of God. Now, people go to the Super Bowl because it's awesome. Yeah, I was at the Super Bowl. Yeah, I was there. Row 39, that kind of thing. My nephew uh, went to the Super Bowl a few years ago when the Packers were in d down in Dallas, right? On his wall, he has a picture of that stadium, that game, right there on his wall. Then he has the stub of the ticket right there. I was right here. See that little black thing? That's me right up there, Super Bowl. And see, a lot of people are like that. But they live for glory days. Like I said, our glory days are to come. Heaven. Being with God is an amazing, amazing thing. Look at Isaiah chapter 6. Now every time somebody came in contact with God, they did exactly what happens here. Isaiah chapter 6. Verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah's like right in the middle of the Bible. So if you just open right in the middle. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. Now, that'd be weird right there. That'd be a, a, a freaky dream, right? Wouldn't it? And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. And the whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices and the doorposts and thresholds shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. Just at the sound of their voices, everything started to shake. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And you look at this, and Isaiah's like, I'm dead. <laughs> What's going to happen to me? I'm a dirty person. And really, it's easy to compare ourselves to one another, but when you're with God, you see your, your sin and your, your, the dirt and he says, I I'm done. Woe to me. And, and they take care of Isaiah there. But look, let's look at Daniel, chapter 5. Goes Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Chapter 5. Okay, so what happens? Daniel's uh, with a king here, and the king, uh, all of a sudden, uh, God uh, intervenes. Daniel, chapter 5. Let's start in verse 4. They're having a party. It says, As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote, 
His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his knees knocked together, and his legs gave way. Just seeing God's hand. <laughs> That's it, his hand. Scared him to death. And to, to me, the more I read stuff, like I think, how amazing is God going to be? Look in Daniel 8. Verse 15. While I, Daniel, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, there before me stood one who looked like a man. And I heard a man's voice from the Uli calling, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. Now, who's Gabriel? He's an angel. As, as he came near the place where I was standing, I was terrified and fell prostrate. Son of man, he said to me, understand the vision, uh, Understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. While he was speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. Then he touched me and raised me to my feet. He passed out. <laughs> it says he was terrified and he fell prostrate. And Daniel was a righteous man. Oh, man, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Verse 27, he says, I, Daniel, was exhausted and lay ill for several days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. Can't even understand it. Isn't this awesome stuff? Look in uh, Daniel chapter 10, verse 7. I, Daniel, poor Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them, and they fled and hid themselves. They didn't even see it. <laughs> and they ran, fled, and hid. So I was left alone. Gazing at this great vision, I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and as I listened, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. Poor Daniel, he's getting beat up all over the place. And I could go on and on and on about people who came in contact with, you know, a hand and this and that. And it just shows how uh, unreal to God, unreal the vision of God is to us. We wouldn't be doing a lot of things if we really saw the magnitude of God. Are you motivated by awe. In Ecclesiastes, God says, stand in awe of me. You know you're pretty powerful when you can say something like that. Stand in awe of me. Are you in awe of God? Have you guys ever seen the Northern Lights? Amazing. Absolutely breathless. And I've seen him numerous times, but the first time I saw it, was the night I was baptized. Back in 1982. And I was baptized like at one in the morning. And I walked out and there was the Northern Lights. Now I had heard about it, but I had no idea. It was just going like this. Bright green, blues, reds. And I thought, it's the second coming. I just made it. I was in awe of it. And, and this is what God does to display his power for us. So go home and Google it. Just look it on your screen. It'll amaze you. Northern Lights. question is, what motivates you? Look in 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to close here. First Timothy chapter 6. Can't go wrong with God. Verse 17. And what Paul does here is that he helps us to get more of a perspective about our life and living for God. In verse 17 it says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to put, be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for what? Our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, 
They will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. You know, this is really connected with what Jesus was saying about the sheep and the goats. He says, don't put your hope in wealth, but be generous and willing to share because you're going to get a lot after you die. You're laying up a treasure in heaven. And it comes down to what do you treasure? Do you treasure your relationship with God or something else? What is your God? What is it that you love? There's a football player by the name of Junior Seau. You guys know him? He played for the NFL for like 17 years, and he was in the Pro Bowl for 12 years. This guy was an animal. He was amazing. And there's a quote that I have from him. After one of the Super Bowls he went to, it says, the Super Bowl is a game. Life is for real. What I went through helped me today. I won't forget. I can't forget. Because a man who forgets his past sometimes loses his soul and forgets where to go in the future. In 2012, he committed suicide. And you got to look at it. He had it all. But imagine him thinking, now what? Is that it? Is that the glory? And he commits suicide. And see, really it comes down to us seeing things from God's perspective. No, it's just the beginning. Every day is a day closer to God. The question is, what motivates you? Why are you here today? Why do you read your Bible? Why do you share your faith? What's going on in your heart? I want you to challenge yourself today. I want you to ask yourself those questions, and let's be in awe of God. Amen. Amen.